Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I am an educator at the museum. And this afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ava Brettler, a Holocaust survivor who will share her story with you. And afterwards, we'll have the opportunity for questions. Before we begin, I would like to share a quick history of the museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that future generations would always remember and learn from this tragic history. In the early 1960s, the Holocaust had only ended about 15 years earlier, and most survivors were not yet willing to relive their trauma, largely because the public was by and large not yet ready to listen to it. But thanks to the courage and foresight of this group of survivors, we have what became the first and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States, always with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. We can't do the work that we do today without our survivor community, who still on a regular basis shares their stories with groups, particularly with the future generations to make sure that we can all carry on this memory. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Ava Brettler, a big uh, um, important part of our community. Ava, thank you so much for everything that you do for our museum and for our community by sharing your story and for being with us today. Thank you and you may begin. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I usually share my story giving a little background on my parents. I was very young. So let me give you a background. Both my father and mother and myself, we were born in a region which is called Transylvania. And many of you heard it that way. That region was annexed to Hungary in 1940. And a lot of changes occurred. My father, his name was Alexander, Shander Katz. He was one of 10 children and he was born in Satmar or Satumare, the current name. My father became a printer. He loved working with letters and numbers. And my mother was born in Tashnard and she was one of six children, and she became a hat maker. I was born in a bigger city called currently Cluj. At the time, it had the Hungarian name of Poroshvar. I am about four years old, four and a half years old, and my father comes home from work and he says, I lost my job. I said, Papa, how is that possible? Last week they honored you as an outstanding worker. He says, I know, but I lost my job because we are Jewish. I knew we were Jewish, we were, we were observant, but it was kind of surprising for a young girl to hear one week they honor you, and the next week he's kicked out from his job. My father had the foresight, and he said, let's collect our belongings, 
and move to a place, a bigger city where they don't know us. We had a beautiful little apartment, paintings, needle points, hanging on the wall. We left everything behind and we moved to Budapest, which was the capital, which is the capital of Hungary. And the war was raging throughout Europe. And there was a tremendous shortage of apartments. And by the way, I have a picture of my father and mother and me as a young girl. So we arrived to Budapest and we had real difficulty finding a place because a lot of people moved to an area which wasn't yet taken over by the Germans. And eventually my parents found the room. And we were extremely crowded, everything in one little room. Both my father and mother find jobs and I was sent to a little nursery school. I'm about seven years old. My mother says we are so crowded. We can hardly breathe. Let me take you to visit her mother, my maternal grandmother, so you can enjoy life a little. And I was so, so amazed because they lived in a small village and they were growing fruits and vegetables and the neighbor next door to them had cows. And at that young age, I'm invited to milk a cow. I cannot see you, but I wonder if any of you had that lovely experience. And I enjoyed being with my grandmother. I got a lot of attention. And my youngest aunt was home. One day my grandmother was baking bread. And she always had a small little piece for me ready before the big ones were cut up. And suddenly there is tremendous banging on the door. I got scared. I hid behind my grandmother. Two policemen came in yelling at my grandmother and my aunt, you have a half an hour, collect your belongings. We are taking you to a labor camp. When the door closed, my grandma took out the bread and she said, your name is not on the list that you live here. I want you to hide in the cornfield, which was back of their home. And when it gets dark, you walk over to the neighbor's house and they will get a message to your parents. I said, Grandma, I'm too young to be left alone. Take me with you. She said to me, for a change, don't argue, but please listen and be very quiet. My grandmother and my aunt made sure I was well hidden. They kissed me, they hugged me. and wish me good luck. I watched as my grandmother and my aunt joined the other people who were walking toward the railroad station. I came out from my hiding place and suddenly a group of people surrounded me. From their clothes, I recognized they were gypsies. 
and Agostol, you have to be extremely very careful because they love to steal young girls, young children, not only girls. So I pretended my grandma was inside and I yelled, Grandma, Grandma, come on out. These people don't want to leave me alone. And wonder of wonders, they left me. I felt so empowered, I fooled them. I did go over to the neighbor's house and my father arrived a short time later. My father was already serving in a labor camp and he had a yellow star on. I didn't have one. He prepared me to go back to Budapest. As we were, he said, we were going to walk and please pretend you don't know me. I haven't seen my father for a long time. I was skipping kind of singing songs when he was approached by two policemen again and arrested. I kept going, my father prepared me in case it happens. I kept going for a while and then I turned back and went back where I came from. The next day when my father came to get me, I could see marks on my father's face, arm. He was very badly beaten. But he got a little paper stating that he kept, he was kept overnight because his furlough was very short. And we had the same routine this time. I kept very quiet as I walked not far from my father. When we arrived toward the railroad station, two young arrow craftsmen approached my father and yelled at him. You dirty Jew, you won't be able to go inside the train. You will have to wait and be on the open platform. My father said, I understand. He looked around trying to find somebody and she, he found a young woman with a small child and approached her and begged her, you as a mother, could you please take care of my daughter? She's a good girl. She will behave. And this lady was so courageous because watching a young child, she could have been arrested. The train was filled with soldiers. I was so petrified when this lady tried to give me something to eat. I just couldn't swallow. When we arrived to Budapest, they had held the people on the platform back and they let us out first. And the minute I got off the train, I started to run. I was so desperate to have my mama hold on to me. My father arrived a short time later. He was pretty angry at me because he also had to go back the same night to the labor camp. On March 19, 1944, Hungary was invaded. That was much later than most of the other countries, one of the last ones. And in amazing short time, they established the ghetto by April 1st. How could they do it so quickly? The local population collaborated with them to the highest degree. 
My mother didn't want her to go into a ghetto. And somehow she managed to get papers to a Swiss safe house. We stayed there for a while until the local government no longer accepted it. And then she got papers to a Swedish safe house. The same thing happened after a short time later, they were closing at dawn. And as they were emptying the safe house, my mother took me and put me inside a basket. I was pretty small for my age. And she put the blankets over me. And she put the basket over a furniture. In Europe, we didn't have walk-in closets. And she told me before she put me on, be very, very quiet and don't go anywhere. By the time my mother came to get me, I was soaking wet. I wasn't eight years old yet. I was so embarrassed. My mother helped me to change my clothes. I turned to her and I asked her, Mama, where did you hide? She said, I was hiding in an elevator shaft. I said, oh my God, weren't you afraid you would fall? She says, oh no, I knew I had to come and get you. We collected a few belongings, but we had. It was getting already dark outside. And as we approached the exit of the building, a policeman was standing guard there. And he looked at my mother and said, move very, very quickly. I don't see you. So he basically saved us. We started to walk very quickly and my mother turned to me. We can be on the street. There is a curfew. Where do you think we should go? And then she remembered that in an apartment building where we lived, there was an SS woman in the same place. And she had a brother. And he used to be very kind, brought me toys. We went to visit him. And we started to walk to his place. As we were walking, my mother said, I have a very, very big surprise for you. You will have a new name. My maiden name is Katz. That's a very, very popular Jewish name. And my new name became Eva Naj. And Naj in Hungarian means big. And my mother said, now you really have to act like a big girl. As we were walking, we were practicing my new name. And we got to this man's place. And he let us in. The next morning was so beautiful outside, very sunny, very warm. And I never attended school before the bar because my birthday is end of November. And my mother said, under your new name, I will try to enroll you to school. I was excited, I'd be going to school. And we got dressed very nice. My mother was wearing heels. And we got to the school. And under my new name, I was accepted. And she even found a new place where we could stay. But she decided to go back for the few belongings we left there. And as we are ready to knock on this man's door, two 
people step out. They were police. They knew our real name. We were arrested, first taken to a police station, then on a truck they transported us to a brick factory which was on the outskirts of Budapest. And we started on the forced labor march toward Germany. Most people who were at the brick factory had with them additional clothes, food. All we had was the light summer clothes and the shoes my poor mother was wearing was really not made for walking. Every so often they took some of the young children and they put them on a horse drum wagon. And then we arrived to our de temporary destination. They set up a place where we, we were reunited with the family. One day my mother's feet were bleeding so bad. And as she took me to the wagon to be picked up, she begged, could I please come on the wagon with my daughter? They put me on, they pushed my mother away. A short time later, we heard shots. When we arrived to our temporary destination, I went this, to the place which was set up to reunite. Each time the door opened, I waited for my mama to come through. It never happened. I started to cry. The young woman who was coordinating things, she said, young girl, Maybe your mother escaped. I'm going to watch you. The bombing was so heavy that night that the whole sky was lighted up. I was so scared. This lady held me in her arms. Eventually we were pushed back in a cattle car and the cattle car was filled to the maximum. And when the cattle car stopped, we were told we arrived to a camp called Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a woman's camp and over four-fifths of the population perished there. As we came off, the cattle car. They yelled at us to give up all our personal belongings. And they also called a few names out. And one of the names was that lovely lady who saved me. She was half Jewish and they assigned her to a different place. She tried to pull me with her, but they didn't let her. As I mentioned, they yelled at us to give up our belongings. I had absolutely nothing except a little ring that I got for my seventh birthday. I slipped off the ring and I put it under my tongue. I was so desperate to hold on to it. We were pushed into a big, big building where they made us undress. I grew up in a religious family. To be naked was something shameful. I put my hand front of me. An SS woman hit my hand with a whip and I dropped them very, very quickly. 
they shave my hair, they sprayed us with disinfectant, and they gave us strange looking striped clothes. And by the way, we arrived to Ravensburg, it was January 1945. And that area is extremely cold in January. So I, we were shaking from the cold. As I, we were ordered out of the building, I stood in the corner. An older lady, as she walked by, asked, young girl, how come you don't go to your barrack? I said, I don't belong to anyone. She said, oh, yes, from now on, you belong to me. I call me Tanti. Tanti means like an aunt. You look just like one of my nieces. She and I ended up in a barrack. They had three bunk, bunk beds made out of wood. We didn't have any mattresses, no covers, and definitely no pillows. So we cuddled up next to each other to keep a little warm. Our daily routine was standing in attention in the morning. And then we had to walk around the campgrounds. One night, as we went to sleep, I woke up and I heard the baby cry. It was unusual, there were no babies in the barrack. And the other woman said, you have to keep it a secret. The baby was born during the night and we are saving both the baby and the mother. But please, please don't tell it to anyone. I turned to my tante, I'm over eight years old now, and I asked her, do you think I will ever become a mother? Do you think I can ever have children? She said, you have to promise me. You never, never give up hope. And I'm teaching you a few no prayers. One night we went to sleep. And when the morning wake up call came, my tante wasn't moving. I cuddled up next to her. The other woman noticed and they pulled me down and other kind strangers stepped in to watch me. The Soviet army was approaching and we were pushed back in a cattle car. And this time we ended up in Bergen-Belsen. The conditions were very bad in Ravensbrück, but we still got regularly some soup, occasionally some potatoes or vegetables in it. The first thing we seen in Bergen-Belsen were mountains of corpses. This time, they assigned us to a barrack. We no longer had bunk beds. We slept on the concrete floor. And by the way, we arrived on March 1945 to Bergen-Belsen. The condition was really, really rough. And we kind of had the same routine, walking around the campgrounds. And one day as we were walking around, one of the women noticed that the behind the kitchen area, there was a fenced area and they had potato peels. 
And she said, Ava, there is an opening over here. We will push you under the fence and bring us out some potato peels. I did as I was told. I got a little scratched up, not too bad. And I brought out the potato peels. They grabbed it from me so quickly. I never had a chance to put a bite in my mouth. The same thing the second time. The third time they pushed me under, I sat there and ate some potato peels before I bought any out. One day I heard a lot of whispering and I overheard that a truckload of children were saved. This truckload of children were the so-called diamond children, and they were going to co collect ransom from them, for them. But they abandoned the trucks, and a wonderful lady by the name of Luba with the help of some of the other people, saved all 54 children who were on that truck. I kind of wanted to connect with other kids, but I couldn't get up and go from one barrack to the next one. The cold was pretty, pretty bad. And one day, my feet were so badly hurt. I was ready to leave the barrack. And as I'm ready to exit, a woman asked me, where do you think you're going, young girl? I said, look at my feet. She said, just sit down. She lifted some garment and ripped up some material and bandage my feet. She said, if you go into the clinic, you will never come out. And please don't give up. One day inside the barrack, it was so infested and I have very light skin. If there are any bugs, they usually find me. And I sneaked out from the barrack and the sun was shining, blinding me. And a strange sounding noise was around me and somebody picked me up. I couldn't really see the person. As he put me down, he reached in his pocket and gave me a chocolate bar. By the way, the man had tears in his eyes and he didn't hold me too close because I was so filthy. It was April 15, 1945, and we were liberated by the British. Well, I ate that chocolate bar all by myself. A couple of days later, I became so sick. I was shaking from the high fever. I figured that's the penalty for not sharing my delicious chocolate with anyone. And they were leading me to a hospital which was established by the British. And just as I'm ready to go in, our landlady, Mrs. Gross, sees me. And she tells me, Eva, I'm going to wait for you and take you back to Budapest. I said, thank you, Mrs. Gross, but I never, never plan on going back to Budapest again. I'm pretty sure my mother was killed. And probably so was my father. 
I have a chance to go to Sweden and I'm sure I will live in the King's Castle. I'm not quite eight and a half. Well, I came down with typhus and I was pretty sick. But when I got well, I ended up on a big Navy ship, which took me to Sweden. Guess what? They never, never took me to the King's Castle. But I ended up in an orphanage. And in that orphanage was this lovely lady, Luba. And she became like all of our mothers. Most of the kids there were Polish. I had to learn how to speak Polish, Swedish, and German. And I forgot how to speak Hungarian. They were really building up our self-esteem and preparing us to make Aliyah to Palestine at the time. Well, I kind of became mischievous. One day I'm summoning to the principal's office and the principal tells me, my father survived. And Mrs. Gross and the International Red Cross to help my father to locate me. And I remember getting a phone call from my father. And on January 1947, I went back to Hungary. The first time I flew on a plane And my father met me. My father informed me. My father spoke several languages, including German. And we could communicate. I understood the Hungarian, but I could not utter the words. And he informed me I have a new mother and a new little brother. I just turned 10. I presume I'm still considered as a young child, but world experience wise, I was quite a bit older. They enrolled me to a religious school. And the first day, day I had to go from the principal's office, a teacher was leading me to the classroom. And I had to make a quick stop somewhere and the teacher pointed where I should go up to. And I entered the all boys classroom in the religious school boys and girls had separate classes. The boys were saying their prayer. I found an empty chair. I put my belongings down. And when they finished with their prayer, the teacher turns to me and asks, young girl, what do you think you are doing here? I said to the teacher in German, can't you see I came to learn? So the whole class left, you know, that I spoke German. A couple of days later, a lot of people came over with pictures, wanting to know if I recognized some of their relatives who didn't come back. They cried, I cried with them. I learned Hungarian very quickly and I forgot all the other languages. I became one of the top students. The communist government decided to close down the religious school when I finished sixth grade and I had to enter public school and I encountered tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. 
my grades did go down. And when I finished eighth grade, the family decided since I'm not such a good student, I should learn a trade. And I started to work on an assembly line. At age 14 and a half, I realized working on assembly line wasn't something I wanted to do. And most of my friends continued in gymnasium, which was like high school. And I looked around if I could take some night school. And I was very good in math. And I found a place where I could study chemistry. And I had to attend a summer class to see if I qualify. And I did very well and the school accepted me. The factory didn't want to give me the permit because I had to work on different ships. But the school fought for me and I ended up working full time and going to night school. In 1956, the Hungarian October, the Hungarian Revolution broke out. The chaos that occurred was very, very scary. And I told my parents and my little brother, I'm leaving Hungary. I put together a little bag with some paper, important papers, including my prayer book. And I ended up being fortunate. I crossed the border from Hungary to Austria. And I ended up in Vienna where I connected with the Joint Distribution Committee and with Hyas. President Eisenhower had a special program at that time for people who studied science. And believe it or not, I got a permit to come to the USA by January 1957. My parents arrived a short time later to Vienna, and then they joined me also in LA. My new mother had a brother's family living here, and they were exceptionally, exceptionally good to me. Uh, on a blind date, I met my Martin, my late husband. Four weeks later, he proposed, and four weeks later, we got married. And the dream of starting, oh, by the way, he was also a Holocaust survivor. We started a family a year later. We got married. We had our fourth son, Yisroel, who became a rabbi. Our second son, Jeff, he became a physician. Our older daughter, Linda, she became an architect. And our youngest daughter, Sandra got a degree in neuroscience and then she decided she wants to teach and she went back to become a teacher. My late husband encouraged me to go back to school. While the kids were young, I went first to community college then I transferred to UCLA where I graduated and I got my degree in psychology. I was very fortunate. A friend of mine introduced me to, a, to Dr. Sarah Moskovich, and she started a support group where young children of the Holocaust had a support group. And that was the first time I opened up about my experience, what occurred. 
because both my parents and my late husband didn't want to talk about it. Through the child survivors of the Holocaust, I was interviewed the first time by Dr. Sarah Moscovich. And we still have the child survivor of the Holocaust became an international organization and we keep in touch with each other. The first time I actually shared my story was in 2007. And the reason, there are multiple reasons. Actually, I shared my story before with, uh, with a school called the Yeshiva. Night of Remembers, and that was in 1994. And that was the other time where I have been interviewed. And since then, I had a few other interviews. There are multiple reasons, but I like to share my story. First of all, I want to put a lot of emphasis Please, please don't keep hatred as your companion. That young child at age eight couldn't have survived without the compassion of total strangers who were in a very difficult position themselves. I also put a lot of emphasis, I speak in schools, on education. Education is one thing that no one can take away from you. And I have been extremely fortunate. I met Elie Wiesel a few times. He actually signed me a book. And he states that every Holocaust survivor's obligation is to share their story with the future generation. I'm hoping you will be my future ambassadors and carry on the memories of our loved ones. I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. If anybody has questions, uh, those watching on Zoom, please use the Q&A box and those watching on Facebook can use the comments and we will answer as many questions as possible. And we do have some questions already. First question is, um, what was your relationship with your, what was your relationship like with your new mother and brother? It was a little difficult for them and for me. Uh, my new mother also had a first husband who perished during the Holocaust and brothers and sister-in-laws. Uh, those days, they really didn't know how to deal with children who went through the traumas. And by telling me, don't talk about it, and finding all kinds of bad things I did, I was extremely fortunate. I had teachers, some of my friends' parents, who were extremely, extremely compassionate to me. Uh, one day I packed up my package. I must have been about 11, 12 years old. And I was going to move in with my uh, friend's mother was so nice to me. And she said, Ava, you can stay with us. And then my new mother seen me 
carrying my package. She says, how can you give such a shame to your father to move out? So I ended up staying and I usually don't talk about that, but it was difficult adjusting for them and it was difficult for me. And later on, when I was a grown up person, I've been told they are sorry. Not my father, but my new mother apologized to me. Thank you for sharing. So you talked a little bit about trauma and what it was like to handle it and how it, there were not very many resources available to you until later in your life. How did you talk about this with your husband, who you mentioned was also a survivor? Did he have a similar experience coping or attempting to cope with his trauma? And how, um, what was this like to raise children um, for both of you? My late husband was a little bit more trying to adapt to the current situation. For me, religion was a continuously something I wanted to hold on and I practiced it. And I made sure that the kids got the Jewish education. I was pretty forceful. Martin was 10 years older than I. And in multiple ways, he helped me. Uh, he taught me how to drive a car, uh, not only to drive a car, but we ended up buying a car. He made me negotiate to, bri to drive a car. So he really gave me a lot of education on multiple levels, which I never had. And I was so grateful. Most of the men who came from his background kind of like to keep their wives at home and take care of the kids and, uh, you know, the kitchen. And he really pushed me to continue with the education. And I realized early on how lucky I was. Um, as far as raising the kids, he really didn't, he went through tremendous trauma. His father was killed the day the city was liberated by a policeman. And he found out about it. He was in a camp also. And uh, it really was rough. So he ended up almost alone. We found some relatives later on who survived uncles and aunts. But for a long time, he was alone and he had to be very self-sufficient. And he also had real bad cases, real bad case of tuberculosis. So he had a little longer time he had to spend in, you know, before he could come to the USA. Martin really enjoyed the family life and the family became very important and he enjoyed really connecting with the new family he got to know through me. And we had amazing, amazing connection. But talking about the Holocaust became something more active in our family after I joined. And I made my husband join also the child survivors. And the amazing thing happened through the child survivors, we ended up writing a book, How We Survived. And in that book is my late husband's story and my story also, including 
50 other people from this area who put in their stories, how we survived. And I forgot to ask you, Michael, did you have any pictures to share or because I have the book, how we, how we survived. Yes, I would like to share some of your family photos okay. that are featured in the book. This picture is my father's mother and father and siblings. It was a passport picture. My grandfather died just before the Germans came in. And this grandmother and my other grandmother both ended up in Auschwitz in the crematorium. And many times when they put people in the crematorium, they didn't even bother to register them. And my uncle, who is on the picture over here, in 1965, went back and got the picture. He found the picture in Romania and brought it out. So we are lucky to have that picture. The next picture. Share the next one now. I did show that picture. One of my mother's sisters survived. And through her, I was lucky enough to have a picture of my mother because I don't know where or when she was killed. So having a picture really is so, so meaningful. And this picture was still taken in Cluj. You can see the independent little girl. Thank you. Uh, do you have the picture, the picture that shows uh, the dates when I was liberated and everything? I don't have that one on my computer, but if you have it, you can maybe hold it up to the camera so that we can see it. Thank you. And that book of Night of Remembrance, that was done in 1994, I mentioned, and it has beautiful pictures. First of all, it has a picture in it showing the place I lived in, Budapest. And uh, there is another picture which shows me in Sweden. And besides having the four children, I'm extremely, extremely fortunate to have my grandkids. And this picture is pretty old. <laughs> I have to have an updated version. And uh, in a few days, I'm heading to a graduation. And this picture, when I received it, I was so happy because it shows my name. I wasn't exactly sure about my birthday until I got my real birth certificate. Here it shows that we were taken in September 44 from Budapest and the times when we arrived to, I arrived to Ravensbrück and Bergen Belsen. And then it shows that I was sick when I was liberated. And here it even shows when I arrived to the USA and it was on a USS NS Marine carrier. 
And that was really a treasure when I got, because as a young kid, I wasn't sure I remembered the things. And I have a bigger version of my picture in Sweden. And I am the little girl over here. By the way, when I was in Sweden, one day I was washing my hand and my ring slipped off. And it was so, so devastating for me to lose that little ring that I got from my mother. And it was very, very painful for me. But in a way, that lovely lady Luba told me that it's not a personal possession which will carry on your memory but your memory will be carried in your heart and soul. And one day we had an event at the Pan Pacific Park and I was interviewed and my youngest grandchild is on that, at the, he's, Alice is still my youngest grandchild. So, I have been actively involved, and that was back in May 2008, so a few years ago. Thank you so much for sharing. A few uh, people in our audience would like to know about your faith during this time and afterwards, and um, how did your experiences affect your faith? Throughout the years, and including during the time when I was alone in the camp, I kind of said certain prayers and that Tanti of mine held on. It was like a hiding place for me many times when I, I just couldn't believe what was happening to me. Uh, I am Orthodox, I keep the religion, and I'm pretty sure that in multiple level, I carry on the tradition for the sake of my I see each time, for instance, Friday night, I light a candle. I see my grandpa, grandmothers and also my mother doing that. And for me to carry on this tradition is so, so important. A couple of times, I think it saved my sanity. And as you can see, I did change my major from uh, chemistry to psychology. And I ended up working as a social worker at Jewish Family Service. And from early on, I realized helping other people and being there in the community you know, just picking up the telephone and talking to people who have difficulty even dialing you. That compassion is really something which can be carried on. And I'm so, so fortunate. All my children, they really inherited to a much higher degree the giving back to the community. Uh, all my kids are involved in different organizations which helps people who need the help. Thank you, Eva. 
We have a question about Ravensbrook. How harsh were the guards who were at, in Ravensbrook? You know, we have limited uh, Randy Schomburg, who was involved with the museum, recommended me a couple of times to speak. And once I was speaking to a group of people who are connected with Swedish schools that actually went out to interview Holocaust survivors. They were the first ones to interview Holocaust survivors. And there was a special uh, gathering quite a few years ago. And Sarah Moscovich was there also um, in Pacific Palisades in the temple. And I still get calls from one of the person who coordinated the program. Uh, I think as a young child, please try to rewind the clock and try to picture yourself at eight years old. I think the trauma of not having next to me my mother was something that affected me more. And uh, the things that were occurring, it were happening, but I, I was in a state of shock. <coughs> in retrospect, I realized, but seeing and hearing and the screams and one minute to the next, you know, a person next to me was shot. It was something, but my tante told me, just hold on to the hope and, and say a couple of prayers. And I kept on doing that. I was always, always extremely fortunate. They had people who connected with me and gave me positive feedback. Thank you, Ava. We have several people um, thanking you today for speaking and um, one comment says, I will definitely be one of your future ambassadors, as will so many others. I appreciate it. So thank you so much to our audience. I know um, those who listen to our survivor talks are certainly the future ambassadors, because I know that you pass on these memories and these stories to those around you. And this is why the survivors who founded our museum did this because they wanted to make sure these stories and the memory of those who were lost will always be remembered. And Ava, I would like to conclude by asking you, I know you mentioned this a little bit, but you speak so often to students. What would you like your audience to take away from learning your story? Well, First of all, today was a little unusual because I haven't seen my audience at all. So seeing the audience and their reflection many times is meaningful. Uh, when I speak in schools, I usually give the students an assignment. And that assignment is when you go home, Please let your loved ones know how much they mean to you. Because many times we seem to forget that. And the appreciation in both ways. I think just reaching out in the community too. I know both Michael and I ended up going to a funeral just a few days ago 
where a Holocaust survivor passed on. And just realizing the people who will carry on, and many of them let us, I met a lot of young people who let me know that they heard me speak at their school and they introduced me to their parents. And just practicing that human kindness, compassion. I really would like to see that people exercise that. And I know you, my friend, Ella Michael, you know how to pick up the phone and reach out to people. And it really makes a tremendous, tremendous positive effect on people. Because unfortunately, age and health conditions and sometimes unforeseen reason, some of the people we were so close to cannot do it now. And it's not only for Holocaust survivors, it's also can be age or medical re reasons where some people are unable to connect like they used to. So I think that is, and please, please use on a daily level some compassion, but you kind of, and allow it to be part of your life. Thank you so much for sharing. And I want to read one more comment from one of our docents who was listening to you today. It was so heartwarming to hear how when you were in the midst of all the atrocities around you, you were helped by so many good people. And this is something I have always taken away from your story that, of course, this is a time in our history where we saw some of the the worst behavior from human beings and at the same time some of the best people as well people who helped you um, and others thank you so much for sharing not just today but all the times that you share this story on a regular basis particularly to students our future generations because i know that you and as all of our speakers certainly make such an impact on our future and our community. So I thank you for everything that you do for us and thank you to our audience for listening and for engaging your questions. We hope to see you next week. Um, Gerda Seifer will be speaking. So we hope you can tune in then and please visit our museum. We are open. You can visit our website to see how you can make a reservation. And we do still have virtual programs on a regular basis. You can learn about this on our website as well. And you also happen to have that book at yes. the museum. Yes, and thank you for sharing. We do have the book, How We Survived. You can purchase it at the museum. And Ava's story and her late husband's story are both featured in the book. And Ava, wishing you and everyone else who observes a Chag Sameach this weekend. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, and the same to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and continue all your hard work. I appreciate it. Too. Thank you so much, and you Thank as well, Ava. We're so grateful to have you in our community. Thank you. And I'm always ready for some input. If you feel I should include something, I will. Or if I should omit something, I can hear you. Eva, you're always perfect. Thank you so oh, much. Apart from being perfect, I don't want to carry that. <laughs> well, in my mind. Thank you very thank much, Eva. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.